Great, thanks. So I start every webinar with a list of the design principles. And that's not because I don't think that you know what they are, because many of you have been in multiple webinars before or have taken the summer course. And so I'm reasonably certain that most of you know about the design principles, but all of the patterns approach courses are set up with these design principles in mind, eight of them in total. And you can click on the, the links that describe those in uh, more or less detail, the two pager or the full version. But I bring those up because they're important reminders for why the units are structured the way that they are, why the content is, the, the content that, that has been selected is the way it is. And today we'll be looking at our unit four, which uh, some of you, I think, attended uh, Avery Marvin and I did a talk at US OSTA this year about the opportunities for being culturally relevant in patterns biology, and most of it centered around this unit. So this unit really focuses on the um, on the culturally responsive design principle, but of course there are others that are in incorporated as well. So that res those resources there for you. Um, if you need a refresher. And I'm realizing that I didn't do an official introduction. So Jason, I'll let you go first. Sure. I'm Jason Bach. I teach in Hillsboro, I guess Hillsboro, Oregon. This is my 25th year, I believe. So I've been teaching biology for a long time. I've been doing patterns for about four or five years, I think. So, and I'm on the council with Charlotte. And my name is Charlotte Denis. My name is not professional development. I didn't change my name in Zoom. Um, and I teach in, in Beaverton at Mountainside High School. But before that, I taught in Western Washington County in Forest Grove. And I've been doing patterns for about 10 years. And I'm on the Biology Council. If you're not sure what the Biology Council is, you can look at that PMSP Frequently Asked Questions and get a much more detailed answer. But basically, the council is a group of people, a group of teachers, just like yourself, who work to develop, curate, and edit the patterns biology curriculum. Um, the original uh, few people who are on the biology council to start with have kind of moved, a variety of people have moved on to do different things. And so we right now we have a group of people uh, that range from Hillsboro, Beaverton, Portland Public, and from North Clackamas School Districts. Um, and we meet re relatively regularly, a couple of times a month to, to do uh, revision and editing work. And right now, in fact, our the curriculum is being evaluated both by an NGSS reviewer as well as by a diversity, equity, and inclusion reviewer. And we're well into the work um, that's going to be over several years to work on updating the curriculum for um, through both of those lenses. And the questions you ask us today and all of the parking lot stuff is going to go towards making changes in this curriculum. So do you know that you are super valuable to us? So things that you say here, we're going to totally use to, to kind of move forward with the curriculum. Yeah, we do take the, the feedback of teachers into account. I mean, we are teachers just like you. So we want to make sure that we're all providing, um, providing materials that are usable by as many as possible. So today we're going to be working on unit four, which is the genomics unit. And we're going to do a little introduction first, especially if you're um, used to a more traditional way of teaching, you might be wondering why we talk about, about genomics versus genetics. And I don't need to define these terms for you. If you're biology teachers, you're well aware of the differences between them. Um, but the subtleties of the shift towards genomics really come from the ideas of the Human Genome Project that is now more than 20 years ago. So the big question that we have is, you know, now 20 years on, where, where are we? Like now we can think about sequencing a person's genome just like that, right? It's just, you can just do it. Whereas 20 years ago, that was, it was, it was an amazing feat for, um, for the NIH and the other, pri the private companies that were working on this project. So when we consider what we want to provide to students in Beaverton, this 
curriculum is used at the, you know, I'm going to say, quote unquote, regular biology, not at advanced level biology. There are some schools that use patterns biology as the basis for an IB curriculum. There are there are schools where patterns biology is used as the basis for an AP curriculum. Um, but in uh, in my school, this is the sort of the st standard course. And we want to make sure that the students who don't who who may not be ever taking a science class again have tools with which to make decisions as adults so the future is here right as far as genomic literacy is concerned personalized medicine that that is a that is a potential reality um you know we know that we have crispr that is uh that is a thing crispr is now being if used to effectively treat um sickle cell disease, right? Um, we want students to be able to understand the risk factors that they have. And then we also, of course, want to incorporate a social justice component. We wanna make sure that students have, the, have an idea about how environmental risk factors are being, um, being exposed or causing, sorry, how, who is being exposed to environmental risk factors the most? Bringing in ideas about history and systemic racism and how those things have had an effect on the access to medicine and the outcomes for um, for BIPOC individuals among others, right? So, um, so there is, th those are not things that you will see in a biology textbook, right? From the years, maybe from when we were first teaching or from certainly from when we were in school. So, those are some of the shifts that you're going to see in the in the unit that we're going to present today. So this is the roadmap. We've started to use this um, this image at, to to show the roadmap of all of the task sets as they as they build upon each other um, throughout the patterns biology units. We piloted this. We took actually borrowed this from the chemistry team. This unit is nine tasks long and you can see that it uh kind of winds its way through some uh some topics that may be on the more traditional side and then other topics that may be uh maybe new to you and today we will have the opportunity to look at all of those all of these topics we'll not be able to look at any of these tasks in super detail this is meant to be a um an overview and to show you the all different all the different kinds of versions of these things that we have because they're not all just one and done we know that there are multiple different modalities and that um one type of task might not always be the best for every classroom so you'll see that there are some choices that you have as a classroom teacher to make selections that are best for you and for your students so jason and i are going to tag team over the course of this he's going to start out um but before he does that, let me just clarify for you that there are three NGSS performance expectations that are covered in this unit. And again, at the end, we'll take a look at opportunities for assessment and how the assessments would uh, be categorized into each of these uh, performance expectations, um, depending on how your gradebook gets set up. Um, you'd have to, you know, that that's going to be different by school and by district. Um, and we do have, of course, an anchoring phenomenon for this unit, which has to do with disease disparity. And Jason will present that in the um, in task one. And then the big uni unit learning tar target has to do with explaining how genes and the environment interact to determine traits. All right. So this is the patterns curriculum. So the first thing we do is we look at a pattern. So what I do, and you can kind of choose the way you do this. This is, uh, if you go to that, if you click on that first one for me there, Charlotte, the graphs and the maps. So each of these is a slide. And so as we go through these slides, you're going to see a bunch of maps and data presented. So there are a couple of ways you can do this. Uh, you can give them this PowerPoint presentation or this uh, Google slide presentation, and they go through and they find the answers to those questions you see there in the box. Or this is the way that I do it. I have two sets of these for each group. So they get two maps 
and then they sort of present out. We do like a data discussion of that information. So it's kind of either way. But what they're going to note is that they know quite a bit more than they actually think they know. So they're going to see that the disparities between diabetes, for example, there's going to be a larger amount down in the South. There's going to be some in, in California and other places. And you try to ask them questions about like, why do you think some places have a higher rate? And then we also get into cancer. And then we, we look at it by race and ethnicity. And so that's what you see here. We do male, female. And so we start to ask them some questions about why they think these differences occur. And it's super interesting because the kids are able to come up with all of it. They, they pretty much figure out the reasons why a lot of these things are occurring. And they give you some really good insight into these numbers. So the range of answers, I mean, the answers can come. I've had students bring up the idea of food deserts, mm -hmm. right? Or certainly access to healthcare when we're looking at this particular set of data around um, one, one, one piece that comes right out of this one is that white women are diagnosed with breast cancer more often than black women, but black women die more often than white women do from breast cancer. So these are conversations that students are starting. I find that when I first started to do this unit, students were very reserved and a little bit reluctant perhaps to bring up some of these topics, um, sensitive things. But I find these days that um, they are more, more open and more willing to share. So the first set of data come around cancer, and then the second few slides are all about diabetes. Yeah. We do make a connection also to biomolecules and homeostasis with a short video in this introductory task set and helps them kind of see where we're coming from and helps them look forward towards what's coming next. So that yeah, and in, in 4.5, when we get to 4.5, we start discussing and we link this to the reasons why, you know, is there any other reason? Is there epigenetics? Are there other things that are involved? Or is it straight up, you know, because they live in a certain place, they just happen to have this, or because they're of a certain race, they certain they seem to have this. And so we get into all these hard conversations. One thing about unit four in general is I find that people, when I talk to them, this is the most difficult to teach. There is a lot of sort of things that are a little bit tough to deal with in this particular unit. Um, I had a student teacher a couple of years ago that taught some of this stuff and she was, you know, kind of like, this is really, really hard, but it's, but at the end, when we were done with the unit, she's like, that was amazing. This was my favorite unit by far because the conversations that you have starting on day one with, with this stuff. Oh, you're muted there. Sorry. Um, so the second task in this unit, um, we uh, we used Avery and I mentioned earlier that Avery Marvin and I, Avery is another teacher on the biology council. Uh, we did a presentation at OSTA this year about culturally being culturally responsive in the patterns biology classroom. And Avery is a big champion of this project. Um, this is called the Family Health History Pedigree Project. Um, and for time, we suggest in the Unit 4 outline that you may have to select between doing this project and doing the project at the end of the unit, depending on how much time you have allotted to, to this unit. Um, and I have not been able to do this project for a few years because of time constraints, but I do feel, I really wish that I, I'm, I'm going to try and see if I can get it in this year because I do think that it brings a lot of value. So uh, we start out this project with some basic learning about pedigrees. Now notice that this is happening early on before we even have taught about inherit, you know, basic forms of inheritance. 
So you can do pedigrees actually without knowing about, you know, to some level without having students yet know about uh, inheritance, dominant and recessive and that sort of thing, because that's not really the goal of this project. The goal is not to, for example, develop a pedigree for, I don't know, uh, tongue rolling or short big toe or something like that. It's really for students to be able to uh, have a much more authentic project where they are able to survey their family and to collect as much information as they can about uh, about conditions that exist within their family. And they are then developing a pedigree that represents the actual conditions that appear in their family. Now, there are, of course, uh, privacy concerns with this. And so we have in the materials all developed ways to be sure that the material that the information stays confidential so the students don't do the students are the only ones who do any communication with their family members we do have a letter that explains the goals of the project that's been translated into many different languages all the languages that we um that we have translators for in Beaverton so we were able to put that um Put that information out there. Now, side note, if your district has translators um, or works with translators on a language that we don't have the information for, we would love if you have had this, the letters or these materials um, for the families translated into other languages, we would love to put those into the folder um, to, for help to help others. Um, and we also have a um, you know, materials available for students who may or may, for whatever reason, may or may not be able to collect um, information from um, from others. So there's a sample data set and or we've also had students who have collected um, or if they're adopted, for example, they've still co they've collected material or information from their adoptive family. Now, the when they learn about pedigrees early on, I think it's important to just point out that there are now available um, uh, inclusive symbols for pedigrees. And so all of those symbols are presented, including uh, adoptees, um, cis and trans, all of these types of new, um, newer, newer symbols for pedigrees. And all of those are presented to students so that they can make the most authentic type of um, pedigree diagram that represents represents their situation. Um, so this in this project can help inform their decision about what they'll do, the topic that they'll select for um, for their community education project down the road, which comes at the end of the unit. Um, but it I find that it is a very um, powerful thing for students to be able to make the connections and to see that not all conditions are actually inherited in the very traditional dominant and recessive patterns. So this takes a few days. Some of it does get done um, uh, outside of class time, certainly the, the the information gathering for the students. And we have some suggestions about how students will anonymize the pedigree, both for uh, condition and for uh, the, the members of the family who are on the pedigree so that they are able to have the information and kind of the key for themselves, but that no discerning information would be uh, shared with anybody but them, you know, and with anybody else. Just looking at the chat and look at the question list also. Yeah, Charlotte said earlier, if there are questions, just kind of either write them in the chat or just say them out loud. Actually, I, I'm i wondering about, um, I've, I've done this a couple of times. I, I've done this, um, uh, this, this part of the unit a couple of times. And this really does 
there are kids who are very, very upset about this. Um, particularly uh, uh, people who are who are adopted. Mm -hmm. um, they need they. If we want to make this real for them, it it isn't going to happen, mm -hmm. and it becomes real and it becomes really really stressful for them. Mm -hmm. um, do you have it? Do you have some advice on on dealing with that? Skip, I'd say first of all, thanks. I don't, I don't, I don't think you're alone. Um, I've not had a, I, I've definitely had a situation where I've had to communicate, you know, with the with the student about this, uh, you know, about that. But I wouldn't say that my that my situation seems to have been as extreme as what you have experienced. Um, I think that, and it, and it's difficult to do, but we have to make decisions based on what we think is best for our for our students. If you think that, and, and, and that's a tough thing because we don't necessarily know, maybe that's not a piece of information that that student has shared with you or that the school district or that your, your teaching team is aware of. Um, it, so I think it's kind of may even be a year by year call, which is not easy, right. To make those, to make those plans. Um, I, I'm going to ask, we have a, we have a, uh, council meeting on Wednesday, Skip, and yeah. Avery, who has really championed this project, um, I'm going to ask her for her advice, and we will put a message out to you and the rest of the attendees today to see what she says, because as I shared earlier, I haven't had the, um, the time, I haven't been able to squeeze this project in in the last few years, um, but I know that Avery really prioritizes this project and has been able to navigate a variety of situations and so she may be able to put together some uh more synthesis a synthesized answer for you i'm sorry that's kind of like a non-answer but no it's it it and it and every classroom is going to be different and every teacher is going to have to find their own way of doing it i i get that um i'm i'm we're gonna we're going to be addressing uh genomics um immediately into the second semester and I, I have one young lady who I know lost both of her parents uh, mm -hmm. to COVID. Mm -hmm. I mean, like within days. And I don't want to bring that up. I right. don't want to bring bring that that hurt back to her life. So, sure. um, the and I've not I have not in the the two or three times I've done this. I think it's three times. I've not found a good substitute assignment for this, um, so I, I, I'm looking forward to hearing what what you what you come up with. Yeah, thanks. And, uh, looks like Olive put something into the chat, wanting to know how can the assignment be made accessible to adopted and foster students rather than just omitting it. Um, I don't know, Olive. What are you meaning by regular rates of foster and adopted students, like above average or? Yeah, I'm not gonna, I don't, oh yeah, uh, on a yearly basis to take it year by year. Right, so oh, so meaning that, I see what you mean. So that, that that would be something that would be happening on a relatively regular basis, that that would be a, a consistent part of the student population. Um, I'm, I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna defer uh, because I don't feel like I'm the best person to, um, to navigate this question because I haven't done it more recently and certainly not since COVID. So Skip, you bring up a really good point. Um, and I'm sorry for the not, so kind of the non-answer, um, but we, I commit to after, after Wednesday, be able to get back to you with a, with an answer from Avery, who I think will be able to provide a better one than I can. Thank yeah, you both. I think on, on your slide, you did have the data that was kind of made up data or data. Yeah, from a yeah we do, we do have a sample data set, certainly. Um, I do think that that probably could use some, could use some work. So the, the, but we do want to acknowledge that n knowing that one is, a student knowing that they're taking an alternative for some pretty painful reasons, I, I can see why that might also not be the best 
yeah. alternatives. So I feel like choice is a big deal here. I mean, I have an adopted brother and he was always very interested in trying to find out about his actual genealogy and kind of going back and looking at all that stuff. I was also a foster parent for quite a few years. And those kids were still interested in their family and their family dynamic. It's not always, but if you give them a choice between the sample and and doing it the way that everyone else is doing it, then it seems to work. But yeah, it's as I said, this unit just in general is going to be difficult to teach. It's just there's a lot of stuff in here that's going to hit some things. Yeah, I, and I, I just was actually thinking, I think that one of the op options is for the students to do the project with the um, with the family with which they're living. Right. And now that's not maybe necessarily going to give them information about their own potential outcomes, but allows them to participate in a in a way that is not singling them out by giving a sample data set. Yeah. Yeah, Valerie. I was just thinking, because um, I'm in a rural school where I had a class right after COVID, that was a high percentage of um, adopted kids, or just at my school in general, I have a very high percentage of kids who both of their parents walked out on them or one of their parents walked out on them. And so for that year, um, well, I think to navigate it, you could just say when you recognize that you have a lot of um, hard situations, you could just maybe have the whole class do the sample data, period. And just say, we're gonna practice mapping pedigrees and it doesn't, and just have everyone do it so no one feels pulled out. Yeah, I definitely, that's a great idea. I, I definitely try to model being open. Um, I have a, if I were to draw the breast cancer pedigree for my family, you all would just, your jaws would drop. Um, I'm the only one in three generations of women in my family on my mother's side who has not yet had a breast cancer diagnosis. Um, so I think that's not to say that my experience is better or worse or you know comparable at all to some of the situations that you all have been describing, but I feel that showing a showing some vulnerability as a as a teacher in my relationships with my students helps me have these difficult conversations a little bit more easily. So, but that is definitely, Valerie, another way. And I would actually then put to the council the challenge of actually developing a data set that's a little bit more uh, comprehensive, perhaps, um, than the one that we have linked here um, to, to make it maybe a little bit more authentic. Thank you guys for all of those mm -hmm. questions and comments. Much appreciated. All right, 4.3 is, is fairly traditional. Uh, it starts off with kind of watching a video about inheritance and and I think people have known for thousands and thousands of years and your kids know this is that you are not the exact copy of your parents. You are some sort of combination. I always start off by kind of asking them if they've ever heard you have your dad's eyes or your mom's nose. I'm like, do you actually have your mom's eyes and your dad's nose? And it, it it kind of works out that way in certain regards, but it's not exactly like that because inheritance is pretty complicated in how it all works. You know, there's a lot of enzymes involved and things that take places that it doesn't give you the perfect 50-50 chance of getting this or that. Then there is some, some work with meiosis. Uh, meiosis obviously is how we make those haploid cells at the end. Uh, it's basically mitosis twice, but then there's no interphase twice. And so we kind of go through that. Uh, for this, there are these cards that you can see. Um, we actually, in our class, we we have socks. They make kits that are meiosis sock kits. And so the kids put the socks out on their table and they show the division of those socks and how they split. The socks represent the chromosomes that you see there in the middle. And so there are big socks and small socks and pairs of socks, right? So they kind of split apart and so they can see where they go and how it all works. And even if you didn't buy a sock kit, you could probably find socks. You know, it's a pretty neat little thing. And then we just kind of talk about like how this these processes occur, right? And then there's a family pedigree project. 
that uh, Charlotte was just talking about, you can kind of look at how that variation occurs within the family. But we talk about things like, you know, when I was younger, I had to call, uh, you know, my girlfriend's house, for example, and her mom would answer. And a lot of times I'd be like thinking that was my girlfriend. So there's a lot of things that are sort of controlled by these genetics that the kids don't even think about, like your voice and the way you speak and all of those things. Some of those are epigenetic based, but some of them are straight up genetic based, including the, the vocal cords and how you sound over the telephone. The kids think that's really weird too, that I had to call and like talk to mom or dad before I talked to my girlfriend. They were like, what? It's crazy. But yeah, that's 4.3. So I do think it's important to point out here the and a note about the assessment boundary with respect to meiosis in particular. So I pulled up the specifics about HSLS 3.2, which is the genetic variation um, standard. And it's important to note that Meiosis is just one of the ways that genetic variation is addressed. And I actually hit this standard in unit two also when we talk about replication, because you can see right there that the second component um, of genetic variation pointed out in this standard is viable errors during replication. And so down at the bottom there, what I put in here are just the names and numbers of the task sets that address the different parts of this standard. And this is not a standard that you would only hit in one unit. So whereas some of the NGSS standards are very narrow and will might only be hit in one task set or certainly in one unit, this is one that actually spans units um, addressed here in this particular, particular task set with respect to meiosis. But um, uh, but in mutations in unit two and then in cancer and BRCA blast, and then also in the epigenetics task later on in this unit. So that's um, an example of how the you know traditional style unit structure really doesn't always fit perfectly with the NGSS standards. Um, they tend to be a little bit wider much of the time. And you'll see on there that the assessment does not include the phases. So just like unit three with the phases of mitosis, they're not required that they know interphase and prophase. Do I use those terms? Yes, but I don't make the students memorize those terms. Right. And when I give those cards that I was showing you earlier, I actually use those. They actually put them together. I don't give them any background information. They kind of they know about mitosis from unit three, but they, um, but they actually end up putting them together based on what patterns make sense in the numbers of chromosomes that are present and where the, you know, how many cells there are and that kind of thing. Valerie. I'm sorry. Hi. Yeah, I just wanted to um, note in the interactive notebook, I think it was in that unit, that's where you have them draw the different phases of meiosis into their notes by clicking and dragging different chromosomes. Is that right? Is that yep. the one? Okay. Yep. Um, and that was, to, 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 sorry, to be clear that um, there is, the, the goal of that activity is actually to show independent assortment, not mm -hmm. the phases. Oh, okay. The I can... mentioned there, but not all of them are in that interactive. Um, let me go back here and click on that link to show that what I was talking about. I couldn't remember exactly what it was, Foster. I just um I just wanted to comment while we're here at the subject that I was hoping to eventually see a more user-friendly version of this. Um, my students had a really hard time clicking and dragging the um the chromosomes. And I feel like the concept was kind of lost in the activity because it was so hard to execute the activity that they lost sight of what they were even supposed to be doing kind of. Um, there. Just for um, a bit of with, if anybody has an idea about how to do that in a, a free, easily accessible for everyone way, um, this was what we had come up, you know, you can certainly do it with drawing 
right? It's a little bit, you know, drawing with the like different colored pens. And I remember doing that in school. Notability. Yeah. Is Notability a paid for app? Does it work on a Chromebook? We, if it's, if it has any costs at all, we can't include it here because not all the users, um, yeah, iPads. I think, I know that we have Chromebooks, but, uh, it would need to be something that would work cross-platform then. Um, but yeah, so. Um, oh, sorry. Is there like um, maybe like one time for the, the stem cell differentiation game, for example, you play the game and then you take a picture and then you copy and paste it into your um, interactive notebook. Maybe you could do this with like Play-Doh chromosomes or something and then um, have them in circles and then you could take a picture of that and yeah. copy and paste it. Okay, that's a good idea. Let me, um, I'm writing this down actually in the comments um, in our idea capture tools so that we can put some, uh, put some time into some development. Okay. Yeah, this is where I do the socks thing. So I, I have the socks out on the table. They literally draw on their tables with chalk markers and then they put the socks where they go and they move them around with their hands. It's very interactive. And I put a link to it the first link I put was editable. The second one is not editable. So I would rather you use the non-editable one, but if you'd like to see it. Daughter, do you have something else? Yeah, sorry, just a question about the socks. Do you like cut the socks then to show crossing over or how does that work? They actually take a little sticky note and they put it on the top of the sock and then they take the piece of sticky note and they swap them between socks. So no cutting of the socks because then I would have to buy new socks every year. That's okay, because that's what I was kind of curious about. And then they use a rubber band in the middle to create the, the center mirror where it attaches in the center. Okay. So yeah, Zalek, that's good too, the, the color pipe cleaners. But yeah, bag of socks is not that expensive and it's pretty easy to do. Or you might just have socks sitting at your house in various sizes. Oh, I'm typing in the wrong place. So this next task um, is probably about as traditional as you're going to get here in this unit. Um, we spend one task set working on modeling simple inheritance. And this is pretty much pared down activity compared to what, um, what you may be used to doing. Um, the assessment boundary for this, for this standard does not, or takes us up to, but not including Hardy Weinberg. Uh, calculations. I don't know really anybody who has ever done Hardy-Weinberg calculations in a regular biology class, but maybe. Um, so uh, if if you, well, this task that is linked here, patterns of inheritance, and there are slides that are associated with it, it goes, does Mendelian inheritance on single, single traits, then it covers uh, so complete dominance with several examples um, and then sex linkage. And then we also have um, incomplete dominance and co-dominance. And we tried in when we were writing this activity um, over the years, and you guys can see that we have lots of comments in, on the side there when you all make your copies of things, you don't see all those comments, but we're constantly talking to each other in these documents about edits to make. Um, but if you would like to include do go beyond what what is incorporated there, uh, we do have two extensions, one that is a, um, a free published version of something that for dihybrid crossing, and then also an extension for polygenic inheritance. Both of those are linked in the unit outline. Um, but this is one of the one of the areas where when we knew that we were covering all uh, some additional things that were not in a traditional unit, some of the things 
that we might have put into a traditional unit had to go for lack of time. And so those are a couple of the things that had to, um, that, that we still have materials for, but that are, are not part of the, you know, core, core task. Um, we did try in writing this this problem set to use real examples. I know that it's quite common to uh, there are lots of activities around there floating around about um, uh, aliens or Harry Potter characters or Simpsons characters or whatever. Um, but I thought it was pretty important and the team agreed when we were writing this task to try and make the examples true to life. There are a lot of agricultural examples um, in there. And uh, we did a lot with, with a lot with animals to make sure that we were keeping away from some of the things that are uh, perhaps less culturally sensitive. So, um, so that will be, as I, lo I love this animated, gif I found about how about filling out the Punnett square. I thought that was really cool. I found that uh, as I was preparing for this webinar, I think I'm gonna use that in my class um, to demonstrate for students how to fill out a Punnett square um, just for a single trait. What's in the second genotype for the first one? What, can, is it cut off? Can you not see it? No, it comes in. It just comes, the second letter comes in first before the first one. Oh, that, yeah. Um, actually, I have a question. Jason brought up a question to me the other day, and I'm just, since we have a lot of biology teachers here, I'm curious what you all do. Um, so when you're considering hemophilia as an example for a sex-linked recessive trait, I'm curious what um, symbols you use for that. So could you guys just put it in the chat? Like, how would you represent the genotype of a woman with hemophilia? Because Jason and I do it differently. And I'm just curious, honestly curious how others represent that to their students. You could either speak up if you want to, or, okay, Jasmine, you and I do it the same. And Julie, same. So the, it, so the interesting thing is that we realize, Jason and I, in our conversation, that we most often, and specifically in this problem set, all of the conditions that we talk about, we specify the dominant characteristic or the dominant trait. And hemophilia is the only one where the recessive trait is the one that is discussed in the given information. And so we were, one, we were thinking about why that is, like why hemophilia in particular is, and I don't know if it's just because it's the recessive trait that's demonstrated when the disease occurs. I'm not sure, but um, just interesting to, to hear from a variety of people. Thanks for that. They all agree with you. Yeah. Well, I, I looked it up how... Um, <laughs> Well, I'm not even sure that originally where I looked it up, but then I, um, I want to try and I, I, I like making sure that I, I, tr I try to make sure that students are seeing what they're going to see when they leave me, if they are taking more biology classes. Mm -hmm. All right. 4.5. By far the the one that's going to be the most difficult topic in the entire thing. So this is one that we've been working with our uh, diversity expert or equity expert quite a bit on. And she was super impressed that this even existed in here in the biology class. But this is where I get a lot of teachers telling me that they have fear of teaching this unit is because of this one right here. And so 4.5 is how have scientists historically exploited, how scientists, yeah, how have scientists historically exploited BIPOC and marginalized communities. And so what we're doing here is the students are going to read a few different articles. Um, and so I guess there's two ways you can do this. One, that they read this article called The Disturbing Resilience of Scientific Racism. And then they have a discussion about that particular article. Uh, for me, I've always done this as a Socrative, 
So if you are familiar with, uh, with AVID and Socratic seminars, there are more articles than just one. So I give students multiple articles to choose from and they read a bunch. So you can see I have like four or five articles that they read. I think all of them read the Disturbing Resilience one. And so they get together. And if you've seen a Socratic seminar, which I'm calling, what did I call it? A fishbowl discussion, because it is a copywritten thing to be a Socratic. But anyway, and so the I put a group of students in the center there. You can see they are represented by the blue, whatever shape that is. And they are going to be having a discussion about the article they read. Uh, the reason it gets a little bit strange is because we, we kind of live in a world that's been talking a lot about like... Uh, like race is a bad thing to talk about in class. And so as soon as you say the word race at all, there are certain groups that are going to think that you were talking about some sort of thing that you're not talking about. But anyway, so if you kind of hit that straight on and you basically said, this is not what that is. This is not critical race theory or anything like that. I'm not trying to change your mind on anything. I just want you to have a discussion about whether or not you believe that certain groups have been marginalized over the course of history. And it takes us back to 4.1 when we were looking at those maps and the diagrams. One of the diagrams that we looked at was the, the I think Miss uh, Miss Denise just mentioned it, is that females that are white tend to get diagnosed as breast cancer, having breast cancer more than women that are black, but the black women tend to die more. And so we kind of try to figure out why that is and some of it has to do with this, that they were marginalized. And so going to hospitals was not an option. And if you were here for three, we talked a little bit about uh, Henrietta Lacks and some of those things and some of those relationships with how that works. So all of these do that. And if a kid does have some sort of opinion that they would like to discuss, I have them bring in their own articles. So I've had students read whatever article they want and they can bring that in as long as they have some sort of data that supports what they would like to talk about. And as I said, this is like one of the scariest things to do. And the first time I did it, I was panicked. But after I did it, this is by far the most powerful thing we do in the course of the year. And the kids are just, I, I talk to kids after the fact and they're like, that was really an amazing conversation that we had. And I really appreciate that we did that. And so, again, there are two ways you can do it. You can read the article, have a discussion, or you can do the, the Socrative piece or the fishbowl discussion. I feel like I said a lot there. Comments, questions about 4.5? I've always only done the First option, want to go watch Jason in his classroom. Should. All right. So the next, I'm just going to actually jump back here to the roadmap for a minute to kind of show you where we are. Um, and I also, Emily, I wanted to just acknowledge that I saw your email and I need to, and I will answer it about the roadmap about unit three, um, but I'll get to that after we're done here tonight. Um, but the roadmap, here we are about halfway through the unit, right? And we've seen, we've started to make some connections. 4.5 connects back to 4.1 and 4.3 and 4.4, of course, are connected, and both of those connect with 4.2. So the point of the roadmap is not to have nine discrete tasks. The point of the roadmap is to use that as a spiral to help the students be able to answer the question that we asked, answer the questions that we asked at the very beginning. So 4.6 um, kind of starts to open up and, and starts to connect a lot of dots for students, I feel. And there are a variety of tasks in this set, which um, do take um, a fair number of days to accomplish. But when you take them all together, I think that this is also pretty powerful. This is 
new biology, right? We've only known about epigenetics for what, probably about the last 15 years. And there's a lot of cutting edge research that is being done on epigenetics. And I feel like we're, you know, reading something every month in the news about how, uh, about new information that, that scientists are learning about, uh, about inheritance via epigenetics. So, uh, so the gist of 4.6 is how are genes turned on and turned off and why does that matter? Um, it comes back to that same standard we were talking about earlier about um, genetic variation. And we start out with an activity that came from Learn Genetics. Uh, you've probably seen the, the, their logo on a variety of things. Um, if you're not familiar with their materials, they're really great um, and we have three versions of this of this activity that it's called the trait continuum and you can see three examples of cards they think there are eight cards in total that students have an opportunity to read about them and either they're using like physical manipulative cards that's what i do in my classroom um, we also have an electronic version with jamboard but i was very sad to learn that jamboard's going away google's not going to support it anymore after i think fall of 2025, I think. So uh, we may have to revisit that. Um, and then the last one is that uh, Jason is a master with Teacher Desmos and the card sorts. And so he has created a Teacher Desmos card sort um, for this activity. And so what students do is that they read the cards. I have them work in their groups. Uh, each of them reads two of the eight cards out loud to their group. And then they observe that traits are influenced by varying degrees or to varying degrees by genes and the environment. And then they develop, I don't know if you can see it down there at the very bottom. I'll bring it up here a little bit so you can see maybe a little bit better. Uh, they organize them in a continuum from something that's mostly genetic to mostly environment. And the, the punchline is that there's no exact correct answer. The only things that are exact are the thing that is mostly environment, which is customs and traditions. And the other one that on the opposite end, which is mostly genes, which is, um, I think it's muscular dystrophy or another uh, in, in genetically inherited condition that is 100% genetic. So um, it's interesting to hear students have these conversations in their group about about which one might be more genetic than the other one. Some of them are a little bit nuanced. Like this one here says uh, organ damage from PKU. Well, PKU is absolutely a genetic condition, but organ damage can be um, completely avoided even with someone who has PKU if the correct diet is being implemented. So organ damage can be completely environmental, right? Because it if the person has access to the specialized diet, then they will absolutely not get any organ damage. So it's interesting to hear students um, talk about the the balance between those two those two influences. So once they have that, then we do kind of a more uh, traditional lesson style around epigenetics, presenting some ideas about, um, just the idea of methylation. We don't really talk so much about acetylation. It is, of course, part of epigenetics, you know, whether the acetyl tags or the methyl tags or both are there, but we really focus more on methylation. If they are going to go back and, and take some more biology, they'll learn about acetylation later on. Um, but there is a really cool Nova Science Now episode narrated by uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, where identical twins, a, a, an identical twin study is described and it shows how uh, over time they, they did some um, color staining of chromosomes through this study and they they reference a pair of, of twins, I think who are six or seven years old and their chromosomes color almost exactly the same. And then you look at a pair of twins or the chromosomes of a pair of twins who are in their seventies and theirs are dramatically different. And so we, students have an opportunity then to reflect if they know about, uh, if they know pairs of identical twins. I happen to know, I worked for many years with a, with a biology teacher who is an identical twin and, uh, 
he was able to use his own experience to talk about how he and his identical twin brother looked so, so much the same when they were young and living in the same household. And then as they got older and moved out and started to express, you know, do per participate in different types of um, different types of things and eat different foods and do all sorts of different things that their appearances actually started to diverge. So, and, and their um, health outcomes sometimes can diverge as well. And that is also addressed here in the, in that Nova Science Now video. So this part of the lesson is really about introducing the idea of epigenetics, the fact that these tags can and are um, added and removed and genes are expressed differently uh, depending on environment. And then, and this is that we can all shed a tear for uh, for Flash <laughs> at the moment because what you're seeing here is a um, an animation I think that Jason made from 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 a video that was made from uh, the Learn Genetics site when the original Lick Your Rats task was available. Unfortunately, it's not available anymore because it was uh, based on a technology or built with a technology that is not uh, supported anymore. But you may be familiar with the science, uh, the science research project where it was demonstrated that uh, rat mothers that were nurturing towards their pups caused their pups to actually develop um, a higher, I should develop is not the right word, to express the gene for the glucocorticoid receptor more often than those pups that were not uh, tended to by a nurturing parent. And so the amount of GR gene that's expressed is dependent directly, and you can see it there on the uh, coiling of that gene within the genome. And if it's stretched out, as the mother is licking her pup, the gene gets stretched out. That makes it more accessible for transcription, and therefore uh, more mRNA available for translation and more glucocorticoid receptor being um, being produced. So this uh, study came out of, I think out of McGill University or some, certainly somewhere in Canada, probably about 15 years ago. Um, and it was one of the, the big things that demonstrated that epigenetics uh, really, really happens. Um, that the, you can get different uh, differential production of protein uh, associated with an experience that uh, that an organism experiences. And then the last part of this uh, of this series of tasks has to do with transgenerational epigenetic inheritance, which is the um, the 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 follow-up or the, the end result, I guess, of the study that I just mentioned that came out of Canada, where they demonstrated that the mice that were tended to by attentive mothers, by nurturing mothers, actually became, when they became parents themselves, they were more attentive than those rats that were not attended or not tended to by attentive mothers. And so this um, this part of the lesson brings that then to human beings and discusses the idea of intergenerational trauma. Now our team, the, bio, the patterns biology team worked with a social worker to help prepare materials that are, um, that, that, that have a lot of resources available for teachers to help become prepared for this lesson. Um, there is a video in this lesson uh, that comes from, gosh, I'm trying to remember what the publisher of that one is. It's called The Trauma Tracer. And it's about a yeah, breakthrough, I wonder. Yeah, breakthrough films. And so you'll see here that this is actually um, the person whose face you see there. She is a, a doctor, Dr. Marlin, Bianca Marlin is her name. And she is a um, genetics researcher and she is actually researching the effects of transgenerational epigenetic inheritance. Um, and so this, uh, it's like a 
biography slash documentary about her and the reason that she came to this work. Um, and so it's 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 very powerful, I think, for students to to realize that experiences that people have in their lives can lead them to making choices about the jobs that they have. Um, and her particular uh, motivation for doing this kind of work, which I think is um, quite interesting. So there are some trauma informed care slides embedded in this slideshow. Um, and you may want to talk with, you know, the care teams that are involved in your school um, and, and certainly preview this lesson and the material, all the materials beforehand, um, especially some of you identified a little bit earlier that you have sensitive populations in your schools. Um, but know that we are trying to think about that when this lesson was developed. The really neat thing about this lesson is that kids realize really quick how powerful they are towards the next generation. So how well they treat each other and how well they treat their children in the future. You know, they they kind of see all this and some of them have come from really bad backgrounds, but they know going forward that they have the power to choose what they decide to do with each other. And, and that uh, transgenerational epigenetic inheritance is actually reversible. Yeah. That's a huge one, especially for some kids who have had some really difficult experiences themselves. It doesn't, um, they're, they're, they start to be able to realize that their choices can impact the future of their life and potentially future generations after them. Valerie? Hi, yeah, um, I, so this might be kind of a dumb question, but every, I love this unit. It's one of my favorite units to teach um, and always goes hand in hand with our psychology class. They're always teaching at the same time. So that's cool. But um, my students, ultimately always ask me, does licking rat pups translate to other uh, species? And like, does it translate to humans kissing their babies a lot? I know like oxytocin and stuff is released a lot when moms and babies, like when you kiss the baby's head. Um, but I just don't have a lot of information on any studies that have been done in humans um, that are comparable to the rat licking study. Yeah. Um, are there any that you know of? I haven't found any. Um, I have looked. I think that there is a, um, you know, the, I, I don't know how those kinds of studies would get past. What are those boards that they have to go through when they're doing studies? There's a name for them, which is escaping me at the moment, but um, I know there's some ones on hugs and how like parents hugging their children is big. And then there's also a bunch of between like a dog and the family, like the love from that animal to the rest of the family actually lowers the methylization and some of that stuff. Wow. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Kim, you're right. Human subjects. There's a name. There's a name for that. Um, uh, it'll come to me, of course, as soon as we close the <laughs> close the webinar. Um, but I just searched for. um just did a quick Google search here and have association of DNA methylation with energy and fear in dogs. So this is um, more akin to the to the rats in the in the animal um, in the animal space. Epigenetic variation predicts behavior, but this is not having to do with the effect on human beings. Um, thank you, Karen, Institutional Review Board. Um, that's exactly right. So I would be fascinated to look that up. I'm going to see if we can put somebody on that, Valerie, to see what we can find. So, Yeah, and obviously, if anybody else finds something, send it to us. We'd love to Pass talk it along. It. This is when the students figure out that I'm not a hugger. I hate hugs. And so like they're like, what happened to you? I'm like, nothing happened to me. I'm just not a hugger. I'm just writing a few notes here. Are you writing down that I'm not a hugger? Is that what's going no. in your notes? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so there is also just a quick brief thing about assessment. There is a, an assessment opportunity here. 
students can write a, write a CER. We have had some feedback about, you know, that there's just a lot of writing. Many, many, many of the assessment opportunities here are, um, are writing based. And so I just encourage you to think about alternative ways that would work for your students. We're doing a lot more, uh, my teaching partner is very artistic and wants to encourage the arts. And that's actually, if you're interested in that, you should participate in that uh, arts integration um, focus group. That would, I know that Susan Holbeck would be very glad to have you. Um, but doing one pagers that incorporate art and images or doing some kind of, you know, uh, infographic or some other sort of presentation that has more visuals in it rather than um, just, a, just a writing or frankly, incorporating images into, into a CER as evidence, I think is also just as valid. So don't feel that everything has to be all writing all the time. Um, and if you have success in adapting the assessment types to, to assessments that exist within the curriculum, we would love to see them. Oh, and I should have showed this earlier, um, but this is just a uh, quote from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration. Just identify or, or, or supporting the idea of teaching about trauma as part of a trauma-informed curriculum or trauma-informed system. And they said, quote, it leverages the healing value of traditional cultural connections and recognizes and addresses historical trauma, end quote. It's something to consider there. So in that same vein, uh, this is one of our tribal history, shared history lessons. So there are, are there four, I think throughout the entire curriculum, there are four or three, three. Charlotte, three. three. So there was one in unit one, there's one here and then there's one at six, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so what this one is, is it's kind of going back to the, the 4.1 and this kind of chart in particular that shows that there's a higher number of Native Americans with diabetes. It's actually the highest number of all of them. The one thing I don't like about the data that's presented on these things that we get handed out is that they put together the Alaska Natives with the American Indians which actually makes it seem like it's much lower than it actually is. Because if you split them apart, Alaskan natives actually have diabetes rates really, really low and American Indians have it very, very high. And so this is kind of getting into why that may be. And it's because of the food that we have, we, we talk about how they were pulled off of their land and taken to places and they were fed a certain type of food, what we consider sort of a processed food and they were denied their first food. So you can see over there on the right, those are their first foods. And so we've been trying as a, as a country to bring this back so they have access to these foods again. That's why you may be seeing uh, tribal members fishing in places where a lot of other people can't fish. It's because we're trying to give back these particular things. Um, so we kind of go through this. These lessons are to be taught pretty much exactly how they're written. Um, we have added to it, but we are not allowed to take away from these lessons. So this is the Senate Bill 13, which is a law that says that you need to teach these, and we teach three of them. Uh, will you go to the next slide? So this is sort of for everybody, right? So you might not be like, oh, I'm not tribal. So what does this have to do with me? Besides the fact that we just should have empathy for individuals, all of us are dealing with these issues, right? As we eat more and more processed foods, we are having issues. So the rates of diabetes, the rates of cancer, the rates of all of these things are going up in proportion to how much of these foods that we are consuming. And so one of the biggest epidemics right now is is our food choices. And so you bring that into what kids, and, and what's really interesting about this also is that every culture has a certain types of foods that are that go with their culture. So that's actually how this unit starts. We ask them, what are your 
we don't call them first foods at the time, but what are your cultural foods, the foods that you eat with your family that are important to your family? And it's, it's a really interesting unit and you can kind of see how it relates to everybody. But yeah, you can see we keep going back to the beginning. Everything is connected in this particular unit. And this is epigenetics. And that's four seven. I'm curious. Um, I'm curious if uh, in other districts, how how well implemented the SB 13 curriculum has been. There, science is not the only area where there are SB 13 lessons. They're also in math, English language arts, and in social studies. And I'm curious what you all have heard about SB 13 and whether or not your districts are mandating its incorporation. Hey, okay, Springfield's doing it. Thanks, Sonia. Ecology, okay. But Megan, are they, is the district telling you that you have to do that? Does everyone take ecology? It's an elective, okay. Yeah, there seem to be a wide variety of interpretations about when the, um, when these lessons were expected to be uh, implemented statewide. Um, interesting. Okay, so it's, it looks like a wide looks like a wide by um, wide variety. So, so yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. So Joshua, you can be sure that whatever whatever the state law says is what we have put in. So. <laughs> Okay. All right, so nearing the end of the unit now, um, we have another opportunity for a project for students to do some deep dives and have some choice about what it is that they are learning. Um, this is a project that we call the Genomics Community Education Project. And students have an opportunity to select a topic of their choice. Um, we have provided them with some pre-selected resources for the topics that are that are shown there at the bottom of the slide. So alcoholism, anxiety and depression, colorectal cancer, Alzheimer's disease, breast cancer, diabetes, skin cancer, Parkinson's disease, and prostate cancer. Now, if students want to investigate another topic, they're welcome to do that. Um, but those are the nine that we provide um, pre-selected and vetted resources for to kind of take out that uh, research, not, not to take out the research component, but kind of to level the playing field to make sure that no matter which of those nine topics a student selects, that they're going to have um, they're going to have access to um, to good resources, and the all of these conditions are appropriate for this topic because they have genomic, genetic slash genomic and epigenomic connection, and so the students, the goal for this students is to, it's called the community education project because the students select a target audience and the target audience should be a group or subgroup that is at a higher than average risk of the condition that they're investigating. And the goal is for the students to produce an informational product that could be a video, it could be a, an infographic. It could be 
I prefer not to do slides or to offer them the opportunity to do slides because there are a few other things earlier in the year that use slides. So I want them to investigate some other format. Um, I've had students do um, uh, shoot thing links and I have had students do Prezi before. It's kind of a different version of a slideshow where they are presenting information about that condition to educate members of a community that are at high risk for this particular condition. Now this document that I'm showing you here is like a rough draft guide. Um, it is a place for students to be able to um, collect information. A lot of teachers have shared with us that they don't like to give this to students, but just to adapt this, these, in, this introductory material into their slides or another format, because this is a lot of, um, a lot of text on, on, a, on a, on a Google doc. This is not what I would have students turn in. This is really just a place for, for them to be able to collect their, um, collect their information. So they, I identify a, you know, rationale for why it is that they've selected this particular condition. Um, and then they identify what their target audience is going to be and why they chose that target audience. And then this document prompts them to collect um, appropriate numbers of pieces of evidence that support the selection of the target audience. And then also the meat of the project is to identify the genetic or genomic or epigenomic factors that, uh, that are part of this, um, that are part of this condition. And so all of these, the each one of these sections is actually addressed in the specific, uh, the, the condition specific documents. So if I pull up skin cancer or melanoma, for example, you'll see that we have a series of resources available for helping students determine a target audience. And then down here, resource research resources for genomic and epigenetic um, connections. So these, the, the resource sheets that are available for each of those conditions, each of them have, you know, eight to 10 different resources for each of those different kinds of, um, of research. And then uh, the students are meant to select um, relevant quotes or statistics. They, inc they incorporate them here. Some teachers have just had students build their flyer or infographic or video. Um, others really have said that they like to have this type of document available for students to be able to organize all of their information before they put it together into the final product. Um, one of the things that students are have become very good at in this project is to identify recommendations pull, pulled from the resources that we've provided to them that help them figure out, well, what should people in this target audience do to help um, reduce the rate of this particular condition in that community? So this could be something like, Make sure if you have a family history or if you're that, that you should go to a you should go to and check out a visit with a genetic counselor or um, reduce your intake of certain kinds of foods that have been known to have a or have been shown to have a connection. Um, and so this is, I would say, the part of this project that's the most accessible for students. There are lots and lots of recommendations. The challenge that they have is to find research that demonstrates that that particular action will help reduce the risk. So they do a great job with identifying the action and what the, um, the why behind the action, but the research that helps to demonstrate that um, requires a little bit more, um, a little bit more oomph from, from them. 
um, I put that at the highest level of my rubric. They can still get a pretty good score on this project even without that research, but if they are able to do that research, then that pushes them up into the higher levels on the rubric. So the students usually choose something that sort of relates to them. Again, this is a choice, but they a lot of times will choose something that kind of passes through their family. And one of the parts that I really like about this is I have them choose an audience. I think that's in the assignment to begin with. And so a lot of them will choose like their future children or children in general. And then you get some really cool projects that are made that way. So it's not for an adult audience, it's more for children. And so I've, I've seen like children's books kind of put together or some sort of little animation for kids to kind of see that, like what to expect kind of thing. And like how you can avoid whatever it is. A children's book on alcoholism is, is spectacular in case you were wondering. It's really interesting. It is. And I think that's that's the coolest part for me is to see the audience that they choose. Nobody wants to tell grandpa. Everyone wants to tell little kids or maybe a family member that's closer in age to themselves. Yeah, I've often had students select larger groups that, and I, for example, I have had students, I my Spanish isn't great, but it's passable. And so I tell my students that if they want to uh, put together a their project for Spanish speakers or their particular, um, you know, the, a, a community that they identify with, that I will find a way to translate their work, right? If they want to, I have a student this year whose family is from Tonga. Um, and if he chooses that he wants to do it in that language, I will figure out how to, how to get it so that I can understand whether he's, um, uh, translated it or has gotten the information across, I guess, that, I, that I'm that i hoping that he'll get across. Um, I want it to be an authentic type of experience for them, for them to for them to be able to really dive in and find information that will be helpful for the community that they're trying to reach. Down here at the bottom, I uh, dropped in a couple of pictures of examples that have come in over the years. This is an infographic, but we have a whole folder of examples that have been made by students. So you should all have access to that folder. Um, type two diabetes movie, uh, type two diabetes in India. Um, some of these don't have their name, um, uh, the name of their things on there, but can see infographics. Here's, what does this one show? This one's about alcoholism. Oh, an infographic that goes over multiple pages. And this is a good opportunity for them to practice with citing their sources because we know that the sources are all um, available to them, making sure that they're practicing um, using correct conventions for citations and things like that. All right, you you almost made it. Four point nine. This is the last task set. So it's about gene editing. Uh, one of the interesting things we we watch Gattaca. We still do that, and it kind of talks about this sort of idea of genetics ruling the world, right? And so this idea that should we be creating a society that's made up of individuals that are quote unquote, perfect in some way, right? So we're kind of going through all of those pieces. And so most students are pretty clear that they like the idea of using CRISPR and other things to prevent disease and to make, we talk about like Tay-Sachs disease very early in the unit. It, obviously we want to use CRISPR and other things to make sure that kids never have Tay-Sachs disease or any of these huge things, cystic fibrosis, for example but they are a little bit more on the fence when it comes to should I be able to create a super athlete in my home or should I be able to create somebody that looks you know like a supermodel or whatever it is that they choose to put together to create and so if you go to the next slide 
there is a flash debate. And so you can kind of see where that all is. So this is a picture of a designer baby. And designer babies are a thing. And there are some uh, cultures around the world that they are designing their babies just for the sex of the baby, right? So it's very important to have a, a male child. So going in there and, and making sure that's a thing is quite popular in some cultures. But if we look here on the flash debate, you can kind of see there are some questions that I kind of referenced just a second ago that they are answering. Do you see a difference? So like the first one says, gene editing should only be used to cure disease, not create designer babies. And so you have a debate between the students to decide. And sometimes you, you know, you might not have anybody on the disagree side. So you create kids on the disagree side. You're like, you are on that side. Right. If you've ever done speech and debate, you know that there are some people that are going to be on the side that's maybe nobody agrees with, but you still have to find factual information to be on that side. Uh, the inherent dangers of gene editing are greater than the dangers of not editing the human genome. You know, so like, are there big time dangers in gene editing? One of the videos we watched earlier in the year talks about how like most of the time when you go in and tinker around with the genetics, you end up breaking the machine, right? A lot of these things can go in and cause bigger issues. And then governments and scientists will be able to regulate human gene editing effectively. You know, is that, do we want to put our, our faith into the government and say, go ahead and, you know, make rules for all this and how this all works? And they should be able to regulate those things. And then we also kind of talk a little bit about like insurance. You know, it is illegal to to change insurance rates based on genetic markers and those types of things, you know, and so on and so forth. And then who will have access to designer babies? You talk a lot about the have and the have nots, right? So the first people that are going to have designer babies are going to be the ones with means, with money. And so we have those discussions as well. And so you can add to the questions that are here. And again, it leads to a really interesting debate. This one I do not do as a Socrative. I do this one as a, a straight up debate between groupings of kids. That's how you do it too, right, Charlotte? You kind of do it just to... Well, I do something called a flash debate. So flash debate is where, and there's um, material, you can use this for a variety of different kinds of things, but this, the these slides are set up specifically for this topic. Um, each student has the opportunity to either pick a side or if there aren't enough for one side or the other, I definitely push students or or have students go to the other side so we have equal numbers. Um, they have an opportunity to skim and scan articles from based on the anticipatory guide that I was showing you earlier. Um, that's here. This is the same articles that are listed here. And they have some opportunities to write down some information that they get from those sources. And then they gather with the peers who are going to be arguing the same side as they are. We, and they we use the term caucus, right? Um, and they are able to identify, or they work together to, to identify the strongest pieces of evidence that um, that argue the yes side or the no side, depending on which side they're arguing. And then I have we call it a flash debate because I line them up. I have equal numbers. Um, and if there is a one person who, if we have an odd number of people, um, one person draws the straw to be on the end at the first round. And so they get a little bit of a buy. And they, uh, so you have pro, pro side, it has two minutes on the clock and I have the timer there. And then they present for, they have two minutes to present as many pieces of their, and as many strong pieces of evidence for their argument as possible. And then the con partner, the person who is arguing the con side has two minutes to present their best pieces of evidence. And then there's a rebuttal period where the alternate, well, so when the when the first per when they're talking in the first section, the the person who's listening cannot speak. The speaking happens during the rebuttal time. 
and they have two minutes and two minutes. You can adjust these times as uh, as you see fit. Um, and then, and here's the thing that I really like the most about this is that they thank their partner and I encourage them to shake hands, um, to recognize that we can agree to disagree sometimes. Um, and then they say, you made me think about X, Y, or Z. They identify something that resonated with them from the um, alternate side. And then they re-caucus. They go back to the group of students who are arguing the same side of the debate as they are. And they uh, identify the strongest piece of evidence. And then they figure out how they can build upon that. And then they write down some additional pieces. What else can they use to support their argument? And if they have found any uh, parts of the counter argument that they can rebut in the next round, they go ahead and they write those down as well. And so then they have a second round of debate, but they're meeting with another different person. So they move down the line and at each round, they're actually communicating with a different person on the opposite side of the debate. So they, so that it's called a flash debate because they're only interacting with the same person for a total of like, I mean, I do about a minute and a half instead of two minutes, two minutes, sometimes a little bit long. And so they're maybe with that original person for a total of six minutes, then they re-caucus and then they come back and they're debating with a different person for the next six minutes and so on. And so the process continues. And what I, you know, in the slides here, it's listed for, it's, it's set up for two rounds, but I've done it for three rounds before to allow students to really develop the art, to develop an argument. And then what they can do once they've revised their organizer to represent the their best pieces of evidence, what sat best with their caucus group, and then what, what worked best in the debate rounds. And they also, of course, have heard the counter argument from the other side. And then, um, I in the past have had in a cup I have I don't do this every year but I've had some uh given students an opportunity to write an argumentative paper and sometimes I just pick up their um their notes from the debate as a, as a grade because that's a that's valid I think for scoring also it's more just and it's quicker to quicker to score but this also works the argumentative paper also works pretty well if you have a student who is not around you or you can break it down into in, break it down into individual parts or give individual prompts um, there's a variety of ways that you can do it we have some resource writing sheets i know some people who have given this as kind of like a final exam for a trimester or um, for a quarter so there are um, different kinds of options i've also done it some years where we do the flash debate and then we don't do the paper at all and I would say it's probably more common that we don't do the paper than when we do. So it's just another opportunity there for um, for an for a possible assessment. But I like that flash debate day because it's a it's a lot of moving around, a lot of students talking. We um, I provide them with the. Uh, uh, discussion cards and they hold, they all hold on to the discussion cards so that there's no, um, nobody has to worry about whether they feel that they need the discussion cards or not because everybody is carrying them. Uh, they all have the opportunity to use them and there are, um, so there's no, I, yeah, they all have them in their hands. I guess that's just the easiest way to say it. So lots of student supports um, available for this. They can write, you know, CR with counterclaim. There's a graphic organizer associated with that also. Um, so trying to provide resources for students. I've actually, this year, I actually had a student from a previous year send me an email to say, could you please send me a link to the, um, 
resource sheet for writing claim evidence reasoning because they felt that they needed that for whatever they were writing in college, that they wanted to have those sentence stems and that kind of the order about claim evidence reasoning and having some ideas about what to uh, what to include there. Um, I thought that was that was a win that that student wanted to wanted to have access to those um, those resources well after they were out of my class. Anything about that that we need to discuss? Any questions about the debate? Okay. So we're wrapping up and then we'll have some time for questions, wrap up questions if there are any. Um, so there is are several opportunities here for developing a collection of academic evidence. For students, we saw at the very beginning that there are three different NGSS performance expectations that are addressed in this unit. And you can see that 3.1 uh, is the one that we might traditionally ascribe to a genetics unit. And so it makes the, um, you know, quote unquote, the, the, the most sense. And so you have, um, you have several different assessment opportunities there whether you choose to do the pedigree, you could pick up the patterns of inheritance practice uh, problem set as a score for that. Um, the, certainly the genetic and epigenetic research that is presented in the Genomics Community Education Project and the types of information and research that they present in their uh, debate notes or in their argumentative essay. And then, of course, you have genetic variation, meiosis, and then um, working on the CRISPR debate also. And you have then in the expressed traits in the population. This, by the way, does not go so far. Uh, there's a assessment boundary here as well that you should um, be aware of. And this is actually missing one. This should also show patterns of inheritance practice. I should add that there. Do that right now. There you go. So there's that. So a wide variety of things that you can assess in this unit under the different um, the different standards. So I want to just open the open up questions. I have not looked at our questions in the. Oh, thank you. Somebody gave us some feedback there in the, um, in the unit capture or the information capture tool. Just opening up for the last ten minutes or so for any questions. I know at the last, um, last talk. We had uh, several people asking about assessment. So about putting the, yes, we'll put in the sign-in sheet and the capture tool, Jason, if you could drop those into the chat. And then um, at the bottom of the capture tool is our exit ticket. Um, the feedback that you provide in the exit ticket, uh, I'll post here also, exit ticket. There's that exit ticket. Um, the questions that we ask you in that exit ticket are part of what we have to provide to the for the grant. Um, so we do appreciate that. And um, one thing that came up a lot, or several times, I should say, in the previous webinar feedback were questions about gradebooks. So if anybody would like a crash course in what the gradebook might look like um, for rubrics, I if there are no other questions, I'm happy to talk about that for 10 minutes if people are interested. sharing. Okay. 
Okay. All right. So at least we have one per a person interested in listening about, um, oh, let's, oh, that's a good question, Kim. It's probably April 22nd. That's probably me making a typo. Um, yeah, I'm sure that I made the typo. It's probably April 22nd. That's what it says. If that's what it says in the registration. Yeah, I'll fix that that right now so that it is showing up properly in the slides too. Yeah. Good. I probably would have been there on the wrong day waiting for people to show up. Um, okay, so I'll talk a little bit about um, rubrics and grading and canvas. Several, um, some people were asking about how that works. So I am going to just put on my, um, oh, bye everybody. If you're going, you, thanks. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Thanks for being here. I'm going to go ahead and actually open up my canvas and then show you an example of what a rubric might look like in canvas. Um, I know that some, and I can extend, even if you're not using canvas, we can talk a little bit more generally about rubrics. Um, I think many of you know that in, in my school, I'm required to use, in Beaverton School District as a general rule, we're supposed to be using rubrics all the time. And I happen to be in a school that uses the IB middle years program. And so that is an absolute requirement for, for my school. Um, so let me just pull up an example here. I'm trying, I'm doing it without sharing my screen just yet, because I want to make sure that I can do it without showing a student name. Um, so you can see what it looks like. So let me pull up our class. Like biology class here and show, for example, oh, I guess I can just show you the rubrics directly. Hold on just a second. I'm gonna, I need to talk to my children outside the door because they're being a little loud. Just a minute. All right, I'm back. <laughs> that was a little awkward. Um, okay, so let me show you what I have going here in Canvas. And it, I know some of some use Google Classroom, and I think that rubrics work well in Google Classroom as well. Um, but I'll show you what they look like in Canvas because I think that some um, uh, some of you are using many, maybe many of you are using Canvas. So what I have here on my Canvas page, I clicked on rubrics. You may or may not have that feature enabled. Um, but if I pull up, I don't have anything for unit four here because we haven't started unit four yet. But if we take a look, for example, at um, something very simple, this is even population's carrying capacity is not a task that I pick up for a summative score. I pick it up for formative. So I'll show you an, a simple example first. I just do this, what's at the plus equals minus or working towards proficiency, where just a very simple rubric where I've identified, you know, some basic things that I want them to be able to do. They should be able to, um, at the basic level, determine carrying capacity of an ecosystem and then identify how limiting factors affect the carrying capacity. If they can make a prediction about that accurately, then they're at the level that I expect them to be. And then if they were able to make novel claims about the change in carrying capacity, then that's a plus, you know, the highly proficient in this case. So I use, we have the ability in our grade book to do a formative grade like plus equals minus. And so that's what why I use that um, those rep represent those symbols here. Oh, that's supposed to say, yeah, minus is down here. I have kind of two levels for the equals. But if I were to go to look at something 
that um, has, you know, that is going to score for the academic. I might put, um, we'd use a different, um, different rubric. Now, again, I'm using the MYP or middle, middle years program rubrics. So these might look a little bit different from what you, um, what you might be using in terms of the content of the rubric. Um, but in Canvas, you are able to set out um, different categories for your rubric under the criteria. And you can even weight them in such a way that they, um, that it will automatically wait for you. And then, so this is for example, for a lab, the front half of a lab. So you have um, back, some background information and research question, hypothesis and procedure. And we run on a score of one to eight, or we do scoring one to eight. So the total number of points is eight. So that's what that is. So depending on your system, you may or may not, that may or may not work for you, but I know that that's something that people were interested in from a previous session. Yeah, Valerie, go ahead. I think it's basically there are few of us okay. left. So. Um, so you ascend. Uh oh. Uh oh, we lost you. Valerie, we totally lost you. Okay. Anybody else have something that they would like to yeah. ask? Hopefully we have Valerie. Okay, back. Oh, there she is. Oh, sorry, I walked away from my router. <laughs> um, so you don't have very many grades that go into your grade book every year. Is that a true statement? That is a true statement. I have every semester somewhere between nine and 12 grades. And is that like pretty typical at your school in general? So you don't get a lot of ruffled feathers? For... That is pretty true, for yes. That? Yeah. Well, I, I should say in the science department, I don't know about other subject areas. Okay. And so then the students, the reaction to that is kind of like, do you get a lot of students not doing the ungraded assignments? So the way that I handle that is that I tell them the that when something is a formative task, that um, if they don't do that, they're going to have a really hard time doing the things that are scored. So that's we learning as we I develop you know those are developed kind of as and and set it out there as a learning opportunity for them to be able to say okay well this is my practice figuring out how this works. Um, and then I'm gonna apply that knowledge in the graded task. Um, the other thing that I think it's important to note is that our, in my district, the grading system, we assess behavior separately. We have a separate scale for behavior and we're required to put separate marks in the grade book for behavior. And we are not allowed, we are allowed to set deadlines and we are allowed to give a one when a student does not turn in a task, but we cannot grade down if a kid turns something in late. We can say, okay, you didn't you you didn't meet the deadline. You're going to have to wait for the next opportunity. We have to provide multiple opportunities to demonstrate proficiency in one in any one area. So if you're in a more traditional system where you're grading based on the standards. You might have to say, okay, well, let me go back to my, let me go back here, um, to our assessment list, right? So here's our assessment list. If you're assessing, let's say 3.1, LHSLS 3.1, you might select, you might not be able to do all of these, but maybe you say you do three of them. If a kid, does two of them, but doesn't do the third one, right? Then you're still giving them opportunity, multiple opportunities to show proficiency in that standard. They don't all hit exactly the same, the standard the same way, right? But if they only do two of the three, 
then their 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 grade on that standard is going to demonstrate that they don't have a complete understanding of that standard. Does that make sense? So the idea so they'd of, have to oh, sorry. So they'd have to do all three of the standards to even have a chance at demonstrating that they fully understand the standard. Right. And 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 so a way to I mean in, in concrete terms, if they um, I mean, I always reserve my teacher judgment at the very end. And I am a, a, in my district, I'm very, we are empowered to do that, to look at the overall score at the end of the semester and say to ourselves, does this score that the computer has calculated, does that accurately represent what this student knows about these topics that we've covered? And we are empowered to either raise or drop, although I've never known anyone to drop a score at the end of the semester, but we are given the the total, we are totally allowed to make, make professional judgment changes to grades at the end of the term. Um, but generally speaking, if a student only does one of the three opportunities for a standard, they're not going to be getting an A in that standard, right? They're not going to have a full rep, full level, full, all encompassing knowledge of that topic. So if you get an, um, so like you scale of one to eight. So the only way to get an A really is to like, do you take an average of all of the yeah. um, scores that they get in all of the standards? So sort of um, ours are grouped. So we have four standards. Like we don't, we don't break it down by um, by NGSS standard. Um, I think that if some, in, and I don't think anybody's still here from Beaverton, um, some of the other schools that are not doing IB middle years program, I think that what they've generally done is, um, you know, grouped, for example, by unit rather than by, by individual NGSS standard, like these three, maybe all of the all of the things from this unit kind of get grouped together. And then each of those, the units then get averaged. The unit scores get averaged. But to be honest, we're also moving as a district, we're revising our revising our standards this year to be implemented next year at high school. So we're probably moving away from content-based standards like these in the grade book and very likely moving towards skill-based standards that will be addressed through the content using the science and engineering practices. That's the way that seems to be going. It hasn't been decided yet. The group is still meeting um, and working out the working out the details, but that's what it seems um, may be happening. All right, I'm, I'm starting to understand it more and more and more every time you talk about it, so. <clears throat> it's a, was it, you know, I came from a system that was a traditional grading system. And I will say that now, like, I mean, not to discourage anybody, but like eight years in, I finally now into standards-based grading, um, I, I finally feel like I have a handle on it. So it is not an easy shift to make. And it's certainly a shift that's difficult to uh to for for community members to make because those old style you know grading practices have been in case in in in, in place for decades it's not an easy thing to shift so all right everybody we're well beyond our well i shouldn't say well beyond we're it, um i i know that all of us have other things that we need to get to. I appreciate all of your time. And um, I hope to see you on the other side, uh, hopefully in person at some point in the future, um, if not at another uh, webinar sometime soon. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody.